Welcome to the first full example from chapter two. We are going to go through the problem solving steps in a lot of detail in this example. So while this video may be one of the longer examples from chapter two, this specific problem isn't actually one of the more difficult ones. But this is probably the place where you'll really want to take notes, not specifically on the problem, you should be working out the problem anyway, but on how we decide what steps to take and what order those steps are taken in. All right, so let's get started. So we're gonna start with part A, and I'm going to label all of the steps that we take so you can recognize them each time that we go through this problem solving and try to label them for your own problems so that you can really see why we do this setup that we do. All right, so in part A, we want to start by drawing a picture of the situation. A simple picture, but it helps us get some context for what we are about to do. So we have a car that is traveling. There we go. And the first thing we learn about that car, so this is step one, the first thing that we learn about that car, and so we can put it in our list of given information, is that when we started looking at it, it was moving at 12 meters per second. Maybe this person left their house, you know, an hour ago, but the only time that we started caring in this physics problem, that was the speed that they were going. And they begin to speed up. The phrase speed up means that we can add to our picture acceleration pointing in the same direction. An object will speed up if velocity and acceleration point in the same direction as each other, and it will slow down if those vectors point in opposite directions. The rate at which it speeds up is our acceleration, and part of the idea that helps us recognize that that is acceleration is the units themselves. Units give our numbers context. That was the big, big idea from chapter one, and so that acceleration value of 2.6 meters per second squared, the units help us recognize that that's an acceleration. So step two is making a list of the given information. Step three is figuring out what the problem is asking us for. In chapter two and chapter three, there is a really, really good way to train ourselves to understand what to do next. And that's to use this phrasing, find blank when blank. This is probably the single most important idea that we want to understand the, that adds to our problem solving. That's the big physics idea. Can we figure out what this problem is asking us to do? And you'll note that not once yet have I looked at the equations or thought about the equations, that is not even on our radar yet. So in part A here, we are asked to find the distance. Now we have to understand that when we are talking about an object moving in a single direction, distance is going to be the same idea as displacement. And if we choose our starting point to be zero meters, then all we need to do is find the final position because we're looking for the difference between where we end up and where we were, which we can just choose that for convenience. You can also think of this if we're on a highway, for example, and we've just passed mile marker 27. When we get to mile marker 29, we have gone two miles. It doesn't matter where we started, the distance that we traveled is two miles. So we might as well start at zero to make our math easier. And then the when is saying, what piece of information do we have at that final moment? Because it isn't always going to be the same piece of information. In this particular case, this five seconds here, that is when we're trying to find X. We aren't trying to find it at two seconds. We're not trying to find it at eight seconds. We're finding it when T equals five seconds. So this rephrasing of the question is helping us understand what to do. 
The other extremely important reason why this is a useful skill to build is because once we fill in these blanks, they tell us what equation to go find. This is telling us to use the XT equation. We are never trying to just randomly guess what equation to pick up, and it really should never be a situation where we tell ourselves that we don't know what equation to use if we have gone through this setup. This is a huge portion of the physics understanding because this is a physics class and not a math class. That really is the skills that we're trying to build in those first three steps. So step four in our problem solving technique is to find the equation and write it down. Not plugging in any numbers yet, just finding the equation. So if you want to, you can pause the video and make sure that you know what the XT equation looks like or where to find it, because when you are doing problem solving, you will have access to all of those equations. But we'll write it down here. So X equals X initial plus V initial times T plus one half times A times T squared. So step four is writing out the equation without plugging in numbers so that when you look back at all of this, you know what it is that you were doing and why you were doing it. Now in step five, this is the math part of the problem. So X is the thing we're trying to find, so it stays a variable. We start at zero meters because that makes our math easier. Our initial velocity was 12 meters per second. Our T at the point where we care is five. And then we have an acceleration value of 2.6, and t here is 5, but the 5 itself is squared. All right, we can plug all of this into our calculator, and that's perfectly fine to do. I will get the two numbers separately so that we can kind of follow along where this is coming from. All right, so we can ignore the 0, and we have for that 12 times 5 is 60 and the 1 half times 2.6 times 5 squared is 32.5. When we add those together, we get 92.5. We always want to put units on our final answer, since this is a position or distance or displacement. All of those use the idea of meters. Now I want us to recognize something really important here. What I see a lot of students do when they turn in assignments basically looks like that. If that is the only thing on your page, then what you have done is not useful to future you when you are studying for assessments or trying to use earlier, more simple problems to help you figure out what to do for harder, more difficult problems. If you skip all of that setup, you may get to the final answer. But what I want us to recognize is that the part that's still here that I haven't just erased is the math part. We are in a physics class. All of that previous stuff is what we are trying to learn for this physics class. What we need to recognize is that this process is training us how to think critically, how to be given a situation with a certain amount of information and figure out what to do with it. So I want us to focus on those ideas and recognize that this is a way to train our brains in the same way that you would go to the gym to build up your physical muscles. Physics really is a way to build up your mental muscles. Skipping those steps is not going to help with that. Okay, and then the final part of the problem solving process is, does this make sense? This is the other really big um, physics part. Does this make sense? Because if we just write down our calculator answer without ever thinking about it, that is also a really bad habit to get into. Because you have put all of this effort into figuring out what the problem is asking for, and all of the stuff that we do in Physics 125 that's stuff that happens in the real world at large scales. Cars driving on highways, blocks falling, going down ramps, speeding up, being pushed. 
These are all things that we can have some kind of understanding for. 92.5 meters, that's about a football field worth of time. If you imagine a car driving, it seems fairly reasonable that in five seconds it could go that far. If we only got like one or two meters somehow, we would recognize that we as human beings could walk that far in five seconds. And if we got thousands of meters, right, that's getting close to miles worth of distance, a car cannot drive a mile in five seconds. We just want to make sure that it's within the realm of things that seem possible for the specific objects that we're looking at. All right. So that's part A, uh, and already like 10 minutes, and I recognize that it should not take us that long in general to do these, but we're describing the process as we go. All right, so we're going to move on to part B. So uh, I'm going to scroll it off our page, but we still hopefully have access to the notes, or you can write down part B question before moving on. All right. So part B, we still have the car and it is still speeding up. So that's step one. Step two is the given information. When we were looking at the car, at the very beginning, it's still moving 12 meters per second. The acceleration is still 2.6 meters per second squared. And we're still going to choose to start at zero meters for convenience. All right, this is the big check now. If you can, try pausing the video and filling in these blanks yourself. What are we trying to find and when are we trying to find it? Okay, so the word distance is used again and we figured out from part A that really we care about the final position because if we compare it to zero, that's our distance. And we're finding it when the velocity of the car is equal to 20 meters per second. Now again, this step is probably the single most important thing to practice because if we can do that successfully, it tells us what equation to use. The xv, or we call it the vx equation. And we can go find that based on its name in our textbook and notes. All right, so step four, like we did before, is writing down the equation without plugging in numbers. That This gives our work context when we're reviewing it in the future. And then step five is the math part, right? So V, we're told, is 20. The initial velocity was 12 meters per second plus 2 times 2.6 times the x that we're looking for minus 0. So let's simplify this a little bit. All right, so using our calculator, we have that 400 is equal to 144 plus 5.2x. We can then subtract 144 from both sides. So we get 256 is equal to 5.2x, and then we can divide both sides by 5.2. We end up with 49.2, we don't really want to put more significant figures than that, is equal to our final position. And then step six, does that make sense? Is that a reasonable number for our car? And we think about part A, we got 92 meters in five seconds. That car, once it gets to 92 meters, is probably going faster than 20 meters per second. And so when it was only at 20 meters per second, it was about halfway along its journey. So this, again, is reasonable because it is longer than a person could, um, could go. And it isn't miles and miles down the road when 20 meters per second is only about 45 miles an hour. All right, so that's part B. Every single equation, every single example that we do, we will go through these steps. 
it is really useful for you to train yourself to go through all of these steps. It is not busy work. It is not training wheels. This is the appropriate way to confront physics problems. And if you get stuck, it is a lot easier to ask for help when you have identified which part of this process is troublesome for you. Are you having trouble finding the pieces of inf information from the problem? If so, we can work through that in office hours. We can train ourselves on what to look for. Are you struggling with rephrasing the question? If so, we can work through that in office hours and have specific examples that help us recognize all of the ways that that could be worded. By practicing, we will get better and this will get easier and more understandable as we go. So I will see you in those next videos.